All right, we're back. And so today we have a returning guest. Um, if you listened to the episode, um, the Ukraine-Russia war, the impact on mental health, then you will be familiar with our guests. We have um, Catherine Ewing here, or Kat. Um, she is a political scientist and legal aid for the international politics and the civil rights community. Her area of focus is international peace and conflict resolution. And she has worked for both the South African and Australian parliamentary bodies, UN division. So she has um, experience and knowledge and she knows what she's talking about. We're very um, happy to have her here today. Thanks for coming back. No problem, happy to be here. Thanks for having me. So the reason why you're here today is we are going to talk about um, something that very big, it's been in the news, it's been all over social media from both sides. We're gonna talk about um, what happened with Roe v. Wade. Finally, the decision was made. It, there was a leak uh, saying that they were going to, um, you know, kind of overthrow that. And then that's what ended up happening. Um, mm -hmm. So for people who may just not know or, or not really understand, it's kind of a complicated um, issue. Can you explain what that means and what that what that means sort of like in layman's terms. Yeah, um, no problem. So um, Roe v. Wade was a Supreme Court case a number of years ago. And uh, basically what it protected um, was, a, you know, a human's right to abortion. Um, and then it also, in that Supreme Court decision, discussed a lot about privacy laws and, and what we're entitled to as far as our rights in this country. And a really important thing to understand is that um, when the Supreme Court wrote the decision for Roe v. Wade, they created what's known as precedent. And what precedent is, is precedent is something that really only applies to judges. And what that means is that, say, you know, someone when Roe v. Reed had still been active had tried to sue someone for, you know, getting an abortion, um, the judge, you know, should have, you know, turned it down and deferred to the precedent of the higher court, in this case, the highest court in the U.S., which is the Supreme Court. Uh, what didn't happen and kind of how we got here is Texas decided that they were going to kind of challenge that precedent, which is something that judges are also allowed to do. Um, and through the Texas court system, there had been a case where um, they had passed a law limiting the scope of access to abortions in the state. So I believe they moved it from um, Roe v. Wade, which you know, had a set amount of time and, and they shortened it to around three weeks, uh, which doesn't really give, you know, someone who's pregnant a lot of time to respond to that pregnancy. A lot of times people within that don't even know that they're pregnant. Um, and that uh, decision got appealed all the way up to the Supreme Court, where based on the current makeup of the Supreme Court, they decided to issue a ruling that the previous ruling, Roe v. Wade, had been overturned. Um, basically what that means is since that there is no longer a precedent for Roe v. Wade, a lot of states had these kind of hidden things in their books that should Roe v. Wade ever be overturned, uh, abortion to some extent or completely and fully would be outlawed in their states. So it, it went from being uh, federally protected under this opinion to almost a, you know, a state's issue. Uh, obviously, it's not a state's issue as it affects everyone in this country evenly, um, and that's kind of how we got to where we are now. Yeah, so it's, yeah, essentially what you're saying is it went from being protected at the federal mm -hmm. level to now it's up to the states to decide, which right. if you, you know, if you live in a red state, that sucks <laughs> because there typically is much stricter, harsher um, restrictions for abortions. Um, here in Kentucky, you know, it's it's a, it's a pretty red state, and um, there's what they were calling, you know, like trigger laws, mm -hmm. um, where you know once this is overturned, that could go into effect. These sort of hidden yeah. agendas, like you said. Um, but thankfully so far, 
that has not happened here in Kentucky yet, though they keep mm-hmm. trying. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, that's the, I guess that's the issue is now you're leaving this up to, you know, states and they're going to have very different laws and regulations. And now it's really going to cause people to have to go out of state most of the time um, for their healthcare needs. It's also really up in the air. I mean, there's a lot of states that had these trigger laws. I mean, look at Louisiana. Louisiana, you know, had said, you know, we're outlawing abortion in all scope. They even tried to outlaw birth control until um, the, they recently codified that into law, um, which is, you know, good, but not ideal. Uh, in fact, when they went to codify birth control into law, I believe 193 Republicans in the Senate said no. And the, their reasoning was with, that they wanted it to be a state's right. And the question then becomes, well, why is a healthcare decision that equally affects every American a state's right? And one of the things with you know, putting this is into a state decision that we really need to acknowledge is that midterm elections for states are huge. And we're coming up on a lot of midterm elections here in the fall. So something that a lot of people really need to take into consideration when going out to vote and choosing who they're going to vote for is, is the even if they live in a blue state where it's currently legal, is the person they're currently voting for pro-life, pro-choice? You know, what is their stance on it? Because the moment that they get in, elected into office, it, it, unless it's you know, in your state's constitution. And even if it is in some states, that can change based on the result of a single election now in your state. There's no longer, you know, that federal protection that kind of stops them from having this wishy-washy stance on it where a lot of people are left unsure, you know, what their rights even are. Right, yeah. Um, Do you mind explaining what codify means? Yeah, absolutely. So codification is the process of turning something into a law. Um, so there's a couple ways that things get made permanent in this country. One of them, and the most obvious, is you know a Supreme Court amendment, something like you know people, you know, women getting the access to vote, uh, things along those lines. Uh, precedent is different than an amendment. Um, so while the Supreme Court can, you know view and make decisions on and interpret what the constitution means, um, they can't change it. So what codification is, is when the federal government passes a law. And since the federal government has precedent over the state governments, if the federal government passes a law, the states have to adhere to it. So what codification basically means is that the federal government would pass a law that would put um, abortion back on the books as something that everyone had access to. There's actually a bill um, that's been circulating for quite some time known as the Women's Health Protection Act. It was first introduced by McCain um, and it hadn't passed back then. So even when Roe v. Wade was active, there were still enough Republicans in the Senate that it wasn't able to be codified because they've tried to codify it before in the past. Uh, It was brought up again after Roe v. Wade was overturned and again, it was overruled in the Senate because of the Republican majority. Um, I hope that answered your question. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, so, um, oh, go ahead. Well, I, I was just gonna ask what, what, what is gonna happen to our country and society now as, as a result of this? What we're seeing is a lot of challenges and a lot of people being really vocal. Um, so obviously we've you know all seen the protests that are happening recently in front of the Supreme Court. Um, there was another protest for Roe v. Wade, a peaceful protest, and they were told um, that they either needed to leave or they would be arrested, that their, their protest was unwarranted and unlicensed. And a bunch of individuals, including you know Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez were arrested for protesting. Um, So we're seeing a lot of pressure on the protests. We're seeing a lot of blue states being very active and vocal. Illinois is luckily, you know, kind of a haven state for individuals, especially in the Midwest who are seeking an abortion. Um, We're seeing a lot of movements where, you know, a, a good example 
you know, ironically is Texas. If we look at the city of Austin in Texas recently, the city of Austin government has done what they've called decriminalization. And what decriminalization is, is they can't overrule the state law saying that it's now outlawed, but what they can do is make it not a priority. And what that means is that their police will not be investigating, you know, if someone reports an abortion, they won't be there prosecutor won't be pressing charges against, you know, cases for abortion. So they've made it so it's no longer a priority on their docket, but, you know, it doesn't allow access. So, you know, there's a difference between, you know, taking someone to court versus something versus them not being allowed to do it in the first place. So, you know, as far as what's going to happen right now, the biggest thing is the midterms. If we're able to get, you know, a Democratic majority in both the Senate and the House, we could always reintroduce the Women's Health Protection Act and, and try to codify it again. But really, and uh, you know, realistically, until we have a, a Democratic majority or there's a major change in the makeup of those that are currently in power, I don't see a way that this is going to be codified. So it's really going to come down to organizations in those blue states and in those haven states to you know, outreach and make sure that while we don't always have equal access to abortion, um, the access that we do have is you know, as easily facilitated as possible. Right, right. And so, and that's really, I mean, that becomes one of the, biggest issues is the ease of access. I mean, mm -hmm. um, even if you're within the, you know, whatever time frame that, you know, your state has designated as you're allowed to get an abortion, um, are you going to be able to get there in time? Are you going to be able to find a center that will do it? Um, then sometimes there's, you know, other uh, waiting periods or, you know, they require you to do counseling or something like that, um, which just extends, you know, the amount of time um, and could really put people in a, a past the cutoff date. Um, mm -hmm. And especially in, you know, rural states where healthcare is not easy to access to begin with, um, it just makes it that much harder. Absolutely. It's also important um, for those individuals that are living in red states, a lot of red states, especially, you know, in the in the deep south have tried to make it illegal for individuals to leave their state and access an abortion somewhere else and said that they could still be prosecuted in their home state. Luckily, we, we currently have an executive order on the book, you know, saying that they can't do that. You know, we, we have a right to travel in this country. You can't, you know, arrest someone in one state for an action that they did in another violates the basic principles of jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when it comes to those individuals that are looking to get out of those states, A, you know, don't fear the fact that you might be prosecuted in your own state for what you've done. Um, and number two, look into organizations in those states who are able to help maybe monetarily. Um, there's a lot of organizations in Illinois that have been collecting donations ever since this, this decision came out to help, you know, specifically those individuals, you know, get access to travel accommodation um, and then, you know, the medical care that they need. So a lot of blue states have those or that are starting to form. Yeah, and um, we can post those on mm -hmm. our uh, Instagram, those resources. Um, I know a lot of people are arguing, like, why is this such a big deal if it's not easy, easily accessed or, or it's outlawed in your state, then can't you just go to another state? And, um, I know a lot of like, not a lot, but some employers are starting to offer those benefits, like offering, um, you know, time off, like paid time off, um, to travel to another state to get an abortion, but you know, that's not every employer and it negatively impacts uh, people of lower socioeconomic status and um, people of color because those are the people that, you know, might not have the ability to take that time off work, might not have the means or, um, can you speak a little bit on that? Uh, so to a certain extent, um, I, I think even just beyond looking at adults and their access to abortion and how it has become limited, we, 
you know, within the scope of that, we, we also really need to acknowledge that this affects ch children. You know, there recently there was a case in Indiana where a 10 year old girl sought an abortion and the state tried to prosecute the doctor for, for improper reporting, which she had, you know, properly reported, everything was recorded. Um, and then that case is still in session. So for those individuals that, you know, find themselves in a situation where, you know, it seems like every single resource out there is gone. Um, I wish I had, you know, a better answer than I do, but it really comes down to, you know, research and, and preparation. Obviously, you know, there are going to be situations in cases of, of rape and assault where a pregnancy is completely unpredictable. Uh, if you are, however, you know, you know, going through, you're currently sexually active and you're not on birth control, make sure that you are keeping up with regular testing so that if you do end up finding out that you're pregnant, you, you can stay, you know, within the time span that you have, or if you do find yourself in a situation where you have been assaulted or raped, obviously, you know, the first thing on your mind isn't always getting the medical care that you need, but it's become even more important to really seek that medical care as soon as possible. Um, outside of that and the resources offered in blue states, there's not a lot of light coming from the end of the tunnel. Um, so it's maybe not as positive as an answer I could have given, but just to kind of keep referring to the resources that we have, seeing what the closest blue state to you is, educating yourself now, no matter what age you are, on, you know, what your rights are and where you potentially could have access. And, you know, the fact that this is so up in the air currently, even in blue states, make sure that it's something that you're keeping up to date on. I know a lot of people who, you know, don't listen to the news and don't care about politics, but this is a bigger issue that you kind of have to now. Right. And absolutely. make sure you, yeah, sorry, last part, <laughs> and just make sure that you, uh, you are educating, you know, those that you have in your life that are younger and may not even be able to grasp the concept that a right of theirs has been taken away. If you know a child or you know someone who, you know, who has the potential to get pregnant and they're not politically active or they, they don't know about this or couldn't know about this, um, make sure you kind of see it as your responsibility to help with that. That's a really good point. Yeah. And, you know, like you said, it's not, I mean, it's not just a political thing. It's not just, oh, I don't pay attention to politics. This is healthcare. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, very different. This is life or death for a lot of people. Um, of course, there's, you know, horror stories of um, people who need to <clears throat> abort pregnancies for medical reasons and mm -hmm. not being allowed to because, their state doesn't think it, you know, that's important. Um, and then the even worse, you know, I, well, yeah, even worse situations of like children, you know, that have been victims of rape or incest, not being able to get healthcare for those things, not being able to, um, abort, which was the issue in that Indiana case. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, they were 10 years old. So it was like, clearly somebody was perpetrating on this child. Um, sure. And the, it, you know, for the a district attorney to be like, no, we need to prosecute the doctor. Like that was their priority. That's what makes no sense to me. Um, why is yeah. that your priority? Why, why aren't you like, hey, what, what happened to this 10 year old? Why are they in this situation? Who's hurting them? Mm -hmm. you, you bring up a really good point of, um, you know, things, especially with ectopic pregnancies. So there, I, the last time I, I saw it, it hadn't passed yet, but they had discussed it. It might've changed in, in the time since I've seen it, but the, there's the political discussion to pass a law where doctors must provide medically necessary care. If you are in an instance where you have an ectopic pregnancy, that very likely could, you know, result in major severe injury, even leading to death. So it is important that if you are in a situation in a red state where you have an ectopic pregnancy and you are in a hospital and a doctor is denying you care, you need to ask for a patient advocate as soon as possible. 
most medical facilities are required to have them on staff. And that patient advocate is someone who works for that medical institution, who it is their job to be updated on what your rights are so that they can help protect you. If you are not getting the care you need from a patient advocate at the facility, there are multiple patient advocacy groups online that you can contact. And while it might not, you know, they might not be there in person, they can still advocate for you. Um, and you know, maybe know the right language to use or the right way of going about it. I mean, we're seeing people right now who have non-pregnancy related conditions that are being denied you know, basic medication because it may cause a miscarriage, even if they're mm -hmm. not pregnant. You know, there was a case in Arkansas recently where a woman was denied medication for her arthritis. She's 73, she's already gone through menopause. There's no case where she could potentially get pregnant, but because the medication could have potentially caused her to miscarry, they would not allow her to fulfill her prescription. So uh, the, the length to which some people are taking this is extreme. Um, so I, I wouldn't be really surprised by anything we hear in the news when it comes to this. Right, right. And that's, that's the scary part. I mean, is that it, it where does it stop? You know, this is just right. one step. Um, we, you know, even if, like you said, even if you're in a state where right now it's okay, you're protected, you have that right, it doesn't mean it will always be that way. And it doesn't mean that it will stop at just terminating a pregnancy. Mm -hmm. um, it could go as far as other healthcare treatments or contraceptives um, or things like that. Like, thankfully, we still, you know, you still can go into any pharmacy and over the counter buy, uh, you know, a plan B, but like, how long are we going to be able to do that? Um, right. And plan B is not effective for everyone mm -hmm. you know, outside of a certain weight range, you know, and I, I believe that that weight range is around 160. 160, which, you know, most women in the United States, most individuals who can get pregnant are, are above that, you know, that's a mm -hmm. very low BMI for what the normal is in the US. So having, you know, that be an option while, while there is, you know, make sure that if you are looking into exterior contraceptive options, you're really researching the medication to see if A, it's effective. Um, and then B, if it, you know, if it's outside the scope of something you would normally take that if you are on other medication or anything like that, you, you really do need to pay attention to the risk right. factors and how they could work together, especially if you're not working under any sort of doctor advisement. Mm -hmm. I, I really like all of these. Um, I've been writing down like all of your pieces of advice and maybe we can make a post with all of them um yeah. this is i mean it's a lot of stuff that i hadn't thought about um that's why we love having you on here because mm -hmm. uh you bring up points that you know neither of us have thought of um it's just like hearing all these things they're saying is like make sure you check like check this and research this and it's just like who has time for that like you right. know like these people that are you know needing a you know don't don't want to get pregnant and have to prevent it or are, are pregnant and don't want to be pregnant and it's just like there's so much just energy and time that's put into mm -hmm. this that's just so like i don't know i know i'm like pre preaching to the choir it's, it's just it's so like unfair yeah. that like yeah that like all of this I mean, educate yourself about resources, um, test regularly, get medical care immediately, educate others. Like, mm -hmm. how, like if, if this, these are the, um, this is what people have to go through. It's just like, there's, there's going to be like, something's going to fall through the cracks at some point because we're human. And it's like, we should be protected for being human. <laughs> like humans can't be perfect. And, uh, I don't know, that's just where my mind is going as so. well. No, you're absolutely correct. I mean, access to healthcare is a human right mm -hmm. and abortion is healthcare. So when it comes to the fact that our country is, you know, doing this, the fact that we're even going through this, you know, it's 2020 and we, we have other countries that are making public statements against the United States in, in regards to how they're currently treating those individuals that exist within the US that, that can get pregnant. And it's shocking and surprising that we're here, um, which again, and I, I know this is something that everyone's hearing over and over again. And you know, hearing the word vote probably at this point is causing some people to have an eye twitch. But when it comes to those elections, 
it is most important that you really pay attention to the platform for those that you're voting for. I mean, the Women's Health Protection Plan has been, you know, brought up twice and, and twice it has been unable to pass the Senate simply because we do not have the votes to codify. Codifying Roe v. Wade is currently the only way for us to get that equal access to care that we had become used to and that we deserve as individuals in this country. So really, until we, we get to a point where we're able to codify it with the efforts of, you know, the many, uh, the effort that the one is going to need to put in will be significantly greater. And, and that's the situation we currently find ourselves in is that that time and energy that you're talking about all these things we need to make sure we're doing and keeping in the back of our mind. You know, it, it is energy. Um, and hopefully we're able to kind of share the load eventually. Yeah. And, and, you know, those are good. Um, those are good things for mental health professionals and social workers and such to be aware of if you're working with, you know, people that can get pregnant or, you know, that they are in maybe situations, um, like domestic violence or, you know, um, they've been a victim of abuse or, or sexual assault, um, then, you know, advocating and, and educating them um, mm -hmm. as part of, you know, your treatment for other things of like, this yeah. is difficult and you shouldn't have to be in this situation, but here's some things you can do um, mm -hmm. to protect yourself and um, just some things to be aware of. Or even if, I mean, it's just, it's one, yeah, like Emily was saying, it's just one of those things you, you don't want to have to do. You don't want to have to, um, you know, tell people in vulnerable situations, you need to go to the emergency room now and you need to, yeah. you know, get th this medical treatment and you need to test yourself regularly. And you need, it's like, you just experienced, you know, a violent crime. And now you have to think about all of, all of these things, and hope and pray, I guess, that you don't conceive um, or that you're able to get the help that you need within mm -hmm. three weeks, five weeks, six right. weeks, maybe if you're lucky. Um, so yeah, it's just, it, I think the other um, important piece, and this is sort of, you know, we've all kind of touched on this, but maybe not explicitly said this is, this is a very classist issue as well. Like Incredibly. you have the ability to take time off work and travel and pay money and you have good health insurance and you can, you know, your job lets you, or you're able to recover like people with the means and with wealth will still be able to get abortions. They always have been, right. but people that don't have that now are the ones that um, are, are going to really suffer from this. And the Absolutely. people making, making these laws are not the people that are going to suffer. Like they're, they all have right. money. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so. they're mostly cisgendered men, which mm -hmm. is also a right. factor. I mean, my, my, my final, you know, closing thoughts on this would be, you know, number one, the overturning of Roe v. Wade did not make abortions, you know, stop happening it just made them unsafe um and i think also you know as uh, if you find yourself as someone who is incredibly passionate about this and has extra energy and has extra resources you know whether you're a cis man a cis woman you fall somewhere on the spectrum of gender no matter who you are if you are not currently affected by the problem but still want to help there are organizations seeking donations there are organizations seeking volunteers there are organizations seeking people who are willing to give up their couch so that someone can sleep on it if you have the time and energy to put in research but aren't currently affected put your time and energy into research on how you can potentially help those organizations that already have a structure to help mm -hmm. those individuals who are seeking their aid. Very good. Yeah, yeah. thank you for that. Um, we'll definitely, you know, I've said this a few times, we'll definitely post all those resources on our Instagram. Right, right. I yeah. can send you some as well. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much again for, for being here, for talking about this. It's very important. And it's, it's so wonderful of you to give your time and your, 
uh, expertise and your just emotional labor to, to talk about this. It, hopefully this, you know, reaches people and, and they, you know, have learned something and they can now use some of these resources to better protect themselves or to help themselves or the people that they care about. Um, and just kind of, you know, keep the conversation going. Let's not let this die and let people forget about it by the time it, we have to vote. And then it seems like not that big of an issue anymore. We need to keep talking about this and, um, and educating people so they can be educated in their vote. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Thank, thank you so much for um, being here a second time. And we've talked about other topics that you might be able to talk. I'm like in awe of you. I think you just have this not like ever since we first met it, you know, Kat and I met at a, a mutual friends game night and we were like, <laughs> just like having fun hanging out. And then we started talking about uh, Ukraine, you know, Russia, Ukraine stuff. And I was like, oh my God, you know. I know, um, <laughs> Emily texted me and she was like, I just found someone that would be such a great guest. Like she's so cool, you'll love her. And I was like, yeah. okay, yeah, ask her. So, we really appreciate it. Yeah, um, thank you guys so much for having me and having this platform that I'm sure helps so many people, especially yeah. those that, you know, are kind of lost with nowhere else to turn to. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, that's our show. If you enjoyed this episode, please share with friends and family. And also please follow us on, uh, on uh, wherever you get your podcasts and we love a rating and review. Mm -hmm. And don't forget to follow our show's Instagram for updates on new episodes. And that is at just mental health podcast with a period between each of those words. This is Steph. And M. Um, signing off oh and good and cat oh, nothing bye no. <laughs> <laughs> she's like bye signing off. thanks for thanks. listening thanks